experience, 97% of it is good. 3% bad, which is not bad at all, but it's not perfect. If it was half and half, I probably wouldn't be in tech. It wouldn't be worth it. Now, what I'm gonna talk about does not represent all women in tech, but it will give you insight on what it's been like for me. So let's dive into the 3%, and we're starting off with university, learning computer science. Once I realized I liked this thing, I was all in. I needed to understand these concepts. I was not paying 60 grand a year to sit at the back of the class, get discouraged, and not figure it out. Usually the classes would be fine. It's pretty objective. You're learning the stuff. You sit at the front. You don't see how outnumbered you are. You sit at the front and, and you'll be fine. But where you get into trouble is when you go to office hours. I remember freshman year, I went to office hours and I was trying to ask this professor for a recommendation. A lot of times if you're applying to internships, tech internships, even though it's just an internship, they want multiple recommendations. I wanted to intern at Pixar, never did, but I wanted to back then. Wanted to intern at Pixar for the summer. They had this internship and it required a recommendation. So I go to the office hours and I'm like, like, hello, you know me, can you write me a recommendation? And he's questioning whether I want to work there. And I'm like, computer science major, film minor, many alumni work at Pixar, let's, let's, let's do it, let's apply. It's also just an internship, it's not even a job. And he made me feel like I was gonna get rejected before I even applied. He was trying to convince me not to want the opportunity because I would get rejected. And then he was like, does this excite you? Does this turn you on? Immediately I leave and I'm never coming to office hours again. Get me the far, get me away from here. This is not it, this is not for me. And the reality is the answer should have been yes or no. Yes, I will write you a recommendation because you are a good student and it's a good fit and I know you. Or I don't have enough information to write you a recommendation or I don't want to write you a recommendation. It could have been, you don't have to. So you can tell I took one class with that professor. <laughs> but let us continue. So I had a family friend come visit me while I was at college. And again, this is my freshman year, starting to learn computer science. They were down for like the family's weekend. We're driving in the car down Main Street. And he asked me, so when are you dropping out of these CS classes and just going into film? Like what? CS is amazing. Like that's, that's the thing though. And that's when I dropped out of computer science. Just kidding. But in my head, I was like, why can I not do both? And look at this. Look at us now. The funny thing is, I was probably the worst filmmaker in the entire film department. I thought it was way more difficult than coding. The idea of coming up with a script, filming it, getting people to want to film your thing, editing it. My films were so basic, so bad. Like, I would cringe every time my film came on and we had watch all our films in the class that we all made. I would be like, I'm leaving. And it's interesting because filmmaking is actually a very male dominated field as well. And so it's ironic that it seems easier or more feminine than computer science because they actually share a lot of different qualities. So let us continue, let us continue down this path. So there are usually teaching assistants that go along with your class. And maybe you'll have one teaching assistant, maybe you'll have two, sometimes they'll teach the class. In my case, they just did office hours and ran labs. And in my experience, whenever I ask a question or I need help with something, the TA either completely ignores me or is overly helpful. There is no in between. There's no just answering my question. I get a philosophy of engineering or I didn't hear you and like ignored. But Honestly, it's better when they're overly helpful because then I can just learn a lot even if I'm uncomfortable. Sometimes they got me gifts, which was strange. But the thing is, I'm not going to office hours for fun to talk to you. I'm also not going to hear about how you think code should be written and your theory of engineering. I just I just want my code to work, right? Like, there's no other motive. Now the strangest thing is I was working with someone once and they would always refer to their code as a he. He calls the function. He iterates through the array. He sorts the list and then he returns a pointer to the user who also happens to be a he. Why are we giving our code pronouns? 
It is a file. It does not have pronouns. It is an it, but we'll leave that there. When I was working in San Francisco, I lived in this house with a bunch of people. It was a hacker house. Everyone was working on their startups. I was there to teach with Girls Who Code at Twitter. It was like a summer immersion program. 20 high school women teach them how to code over the course of eight, seven weeks. And so I was like, let's live in the hacker house. So I was talking to someone and they're asking me what I do and I'm saying, yeah, here for the summer. And the response I got to the fact I was a teacher was, you must be so nurturing. You know how to code, you know how to work with kids. You would make such a great wife. What in the world? I'm so uncomfortable. I remember being like, okay, and then walking away. Explaining to, to someone what you do when you're a woman in tech, it just brings out some interesting responses. Sometimes it's a surprise, didn't think that would be the case. Sometimes it's a good for you, look at you with your career. Sometimes it's a you must be really smart. I remember being at a networking event and people were talking about what they do and I said, I'm a software engineer, I work on this person's team, I build APIs that aggregate a bunch of backend data and the response I got was, that's a feminine way of stating it. Do you test your API? What do you mean I test my API? Asking me if I test my code? No. That's why it's in production. And that's why production is failing. But asking me if I test my code? I, I wanted to say no. Ugh. What if I said no? But of course I said yes. And then he asked, do you know what Postman is? Now Postman is one of the most common tools for testing APIs. In fact, I actually have a video on it and this video was live when this question was asked. So again, kind of annoying. Now some of you might think like that's not uncomfortable. Like he was just asking about your job and do you test your API? Maybe, maybe that's like a fair question. But the reason why it was uncomfortable is because it was almost like he was interviewing me. He was asking me questions to make sure I was a software engineer, to verify that I actually knew what I was doing. It's one thing to ask what language do you use or what framework do you use? There are many different languages and frameworks you can use to create an API. Many different technologies you can use to build it. It's another thing to ask them if they test their product. It would be like asking a doctor if they take the temperature of their patients. But let's talk about the YouTube channel, Blondie Bites. In college, there was this person that would call me Blondie because I was literally the only woman student that had blonde hair and was a little bit feminine. I like makeup and clothes and I feel like that is fine. This person would say, Blondie, come up to the board. Blondie, solve this problem. He would call on me because I actually knew what I was doing even though I didn't think I did at the time. This person also happened to be a TA and in order for me to learn computer science, it felt like I had to go through him. I had to go to the office hours. I had to deal with him in the labs. I had to deal with this person in order to become good at the thing that I really liked to do. Now, there's no HR in college. So the goal is you get in, you learn the stuff, and then you get out. So the channel, Blondie Bites, I messaged my friend Alex and I was like, I wanna create a YouTube channel. I want it to have the word Blondie in it. I need a good name. Within two seconds, he texts back Blondie Bites. And I'm like, that's it. And there are a bunch of reasons why I made the channel. One being I was bored one summer. Another being I needed something to focus on because I wasn't happy. But I also felt like people should be able to learn computer science without having to deal with this stuff. Speaking of the channel, someone once told me at like this networking event, you got hired because of your YouTube channel. And they meant it as an insult. I could just tell from the tone, clearly I'm not qualified, but I got hired because of this unrelated thing and that is the only reason. And this is what we call the networking event gone bad. And this has happened to me time and time again, but you know, I've built a six figure business that's almost purely passive income. So I don't know why they would want to hire me. That might be a reason. If I did it for myself, I could probably do it for them. So clearly unqualified. Now when you face a lot of situations like this, you start to feel a lot of pressure to be really good at what you do. You're representing all women in tech and you need to prove to these people that you know what you're doing so that they'll take a chance on more women. And this turns into a need to prove to yourself 
that you know what you're doing. And this is where imposter syndrome comes in and it's not good. It can actually be really toxic because it will prevent you from taking on new types of work where you might fail. If you think you're representing all women in tech and you cannot fail at all costs, you're gonna take on work that you're used to doing and you're not gonna push yourself. And if you do take on that new work and you do fail, then you must have gotten hired because of your YouTube channel. So what can you do in these situations when you're faced with someone saying things like this, where they're questioning your abilities or they're underestimating you? One option is to just get really mad and start yelling at them and make a scene. Another is to be nice and walk away. And this is the option I would choose for a really long time. It was easier to just walk away, ignore it. If I don't let it annoy me or bother me, then it will just go away. But my favorite option recently is to just try to make them feel as uncomfortable as possible because then they will walk away. And the example of the guy asking me what Postman was or do I test my code, now instead of walking away and being nice, I would say something like, I use insomnia because of X, Y, and Z, and I've actually used this new feature that does this, and literally throw so much tech information at them that they don't know what to do with themselves. Now usually this 3% of bad in tech comes from people who don't really know you. They're nervous, they're not paying attention, but this does not excuse what they do or what they say. So make them feel as uncomfortable as possible. If they do know you, maybe it's worth talking to them and help them understand why it made you uncomfortable. Again, this is my experience. It is not universal for all women. I have so many more thoughts, so many more stories to tell you. So if you want a part two, let me know in the comments. That's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Happy coding.